How do you know if you're welcome when you come into a place? You're greeted. Nobody runs away. <laughs> they smile at you. Offer, offer a handshake or some word or gesture of greeting. Okay. Show you around. Yeah. Like, how many people came into a, come into a building and have no idea where the restroom is for some period of time? I've gone into a new workplace, actually, and had people ask me, like, okay, so what is your vision for this, and what are we going to be doing going forward? And I'm like, I don't even know where to go to the bathroom yet. <laughs> like, give me, a, give me a minute, please, <laughs> right? So um, we, we have a sense of when we feel welcomed. And that's what Paul is talking about here when he first gets started with today's reading. He says, welcome people who are weak in faith is one translation. And so maybe they're new to the faith. Maybe they're just struggling. Maybe they're going through a hard time and they're kind of questioning and, and doubting a little bit. But it, he launches into this description then of a, uh, a debate or differences in understanding that for a long time seemed really irrelevant, although these days it's coming back into vogue, this issue of do we eat meat or do we not eat meat? <clears throat> right Now, in Paul's context, the, the question about that had to do with meat that was being sacrificed to other gods. And so it was part of worship of a different god. And so there were some Christians who said, if, if I'm eating that meat, I am some way participating in this worship of a different god, and I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to eat that meat. And there were others who said, it's meat, <laughs> right? <laughs> I like my, okay, they were not eating bacon, but I like my steak. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to eat it. Um, and I'm going to give thanks to God for it. And so Paul was approaching it from that perspective and saying, look, the issue is not the meat. The issue is, are you faithful to worshiping the God that, you know, the God of Christ. And so today, there's very similar debates going on, right? It was irrelevant for a really long time, but now we have lots of people who choose to abstain from meat because they see it as being sacrificed at the altar of greed and the destruction of creation. And so in good faith, they will avoid eating meat and do plant-based diets, or maybe it's for health reasons or whatever. Um, and then there are others who will continue and these days say, I'm not giving up my bacon, right? And so there is a tendency to be judgy one towards the other, right? We, we make fun of vegans, um, we being meat eaters. <laughs> um, there's lots of, you know, jokes and memes and things like that. And then, and then those who hold a plant-based diet can sometimes become very judgmental toward those who are continuing to, to have uh, meat of whatever variety. So what seemed to be relevant for a long time is, is suddenly back to being relevant again. And Paul's message really is about um, how about we just stop the judginess? I had a friend in seminary who would say, Judgy Wedgy was a bear. Judgy Wedgy had no friends. Um, <laughs> so there's another part of Paul's um, letter that, that also kind of gets lost today. And he talks about the days, like some days as being more holy than others. And we've kind of lost track of that particular debate. Once upon a time, right, Wednesdays were held as kind of sacred in our society, in our culture, being predominantly Christian. Um, a lot of schools would not hold activities on Wednesday night because that was church activity night. Some of you may remember those days. Um, but this debate is going back further. And so uh, the question becomes, do we worship on the Sabbath? Or do we worship on the day of resurrection? Some of you, fun trivia fact, we do not 
hold the Sabbath in contemporary Christian tradition. That's why Seventh-day Adventists and some others will have worship on Saturday because Saturday is Jewish Sabbath. Sunday is the day of resurrection. So one of the ways that Christians distinguished themselves over and against Judaism was to worship on a different day, okay? Um, and that holds true today, although a lot of people in the United States are not familiar with that. So, and again, Paul is saying, whatever, <laughs> right? Pick a day, whatever that day is, and the point is to set aside time to honor our creator, to enter into an attitude of worship for the one who loves us and redeems us, the one who sent the Holy One of God to be our redeemer. All of these other things that we want to argue about and disagree about, kind of irrelevant, right? There are some worshiping communities that would argue over dress code, right? Um, Growing up, it was, and, and certainly um, culturally, but also um, just there's a difference of opinion, right? So Sunday best, right? Once upon a time, you did, if you were only going to had the water to do a, a bath once a week, then it was a Saturday night bath so that you were clean and pristine for worship on Sunday morning and you wore your Sunday best and all of those things. And now there's a... a Another movement, basically, to say, whatever, jeans and t-shirt, whatever is fine, because the point is to be gathered with God's people in the presence of the Holy One. Where two or more are gathered, God is here, and I want to be present, and I don't have any dress code that I need to meet. And Paul's letter is basically saying, yep, <laughs> right, both and. We can be in community together and not be divided by these petty differences. Uh, I had a clergy colleague one time who talked about uh, new people coming into the community and, and this whole idea of welcome. Uh, and they, they sat uh, in the back and they pulled out their popcorn. Because where else, right? Where else do you come in and sit in rows facing the front? And so it was this sense of, like, okay, and sure, there was some snickering kind of like here, right? But this idea of for someone who is new, that might make sense. I mean, the only other context they knew was to go to a movie. And for a lot of Christians, coming to worship means to sit and passively receive whatever is being projected from the front. We've lost the sense of liturgy being the work of the people. That's one of the gifts, I think, of this congregation, is that we, we have a sense that multiple voices are heard and that you are not just passively sitting, receiving things, but you are actively participating in the act of worship. That's what happens with communion. That's one of the reasons that we present our gifts to God, because we are active participants in all that God is doing through our service, through our prayers, through our financial gifts and whatnot. So Paul is really talking about, you know, we have this accounting, we, we need to hold true to our convictions, but that can also tend toward like a relativism, right? Anything goes. Um, and that's not necessarily what he's getting at. Because he talks about um, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God, which seems very personalized, but he just said in verse 7 that we don't live for ourselves and we don't die for ourselves. So even though we, we hold true to our individual convictions, it's not all just about me and my personal relationship or the way I live in the world. Because, I mean, what's the point of religion if it isn't to force our beliefs on other people? Right? Um, so... For Paul, we don't live for just for ourselves, but we also don't just live for other people. So it's not just about making other people happy or not offending other people, but for Paul, it's that we live for God. 
And that's kind of the point, right? That the way we, the way we devote our lives to God is what then should be reflected in the way we deal with other people and perhaps even the way we treat ourselves, the way we live our lives. It's our relationship with God that defines those things. It should be reflected in our lives and in our relationships with other people. And if we spend our time judging other people, or if we behave a certain way because we don't want to be like those people, (laughs) right, in a I am better than they are kind of attitude, that's what we will have to give an account to God for. And that brings us to the gospel reading for today. So the gospel reading is from uh, Matthew chapter 18. And we switch from Paul's perspective to Peter. Peter is the rock, right? Which sometimes means he's like dumb as a rock. Um, So Peter comes and says to God, says to Jesus, uh, Lord, if if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? Do I have to forgive as many as seven times? And Jesus says, depending on the translation, right? Not seven times, but seven times seven or 70, whatever. The number seven is a a symbol of the fullness, right? So the idea is you got to keep forgiving over and over, which can, in our context, sometimes lead people to uh, interpret that you got to allow yourself to be beat up over and over and over. That is not the point, right? It is not about subjecting yourself over and over to abuse. It is about freeing yourself, not that you have to place yourself in harm's way over and over again, just to be clear. But Jesus goes on to tell this parable and says, so uh, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. So when the king begins his reckoning, one who owes him 10,000 talents is brought to him. And this slave cannot pay, and so the king orders him to be sold, sold with his wife and children and all his possessions so that payment can be made. And so the slave falls on his knees and says, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. Now there's absolutely no way this slave is going to be able to ever pay off this date, this debt. It's not going to happen. But out of pity, the king the Lord of this slave, says, I forgive you your debt and lets him go. The same slave, having just been freed of this debt that was enormous and could never be repaid, goes out and comes upon a colleague, a fellow slave. And that slave owes him a hundred denarii, ten bucks, right? And seizes him by the throat and says, You owe me 10 bucks. I need it now. Pay me what you owe. And the one who is in debt $10 falls down and pleads with him, have patience with me, I will pay you. And that's a little more likely, right? He probably can cobble together that much money. But the slave who has just been released of his enormous debt throws the other guy in prison until he could pay the debt. Now, before you go thinking, why would you put somebody in prison until they can pay the debt? That's not the way that works. We do the same thing today, right? We throw people in prison because they are in debt, and then we expect them to pay it off. Does it make any sense? No. Didn't make sense then. Doesn't make sense now. But here we are. So, um, (laughs) back to scripture. So, everybody else is around and seeing this happen, right? This slave who's just been forgiven this huge amount of debt takes his fellow slave, throws him in prison for owing him 10 bucks. And the community is like, that doesn't make any sense. What a jerk. So they go tell the king, the Lord, over all of these slaves. And the king has a less than ideal reaction to this. And so he calls the guy back and says, you wicked slave, I forgave you this enormous amount of debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? 
And in anger, the king hands him over to be tortured until he pays his debt. We don't focus on those things particularly. But this parable is about the servants. I mean, it's about a merciful king and Lord, yes, but so much more about the servants and their reaction to grace. Because that's what it is to forgive a debt. Grace means a free gift. And these slaves have been forgiven the debt that they owed. And how do we respond to that gift? So often, we who have been forgiven all of the horrible things that we have done and said that we have failed to do, then go out and are judging others. We have lots of drama in my family at the moment. And in reflecting on my mother in her better days, um, we are quick to say, you know, for this particular sibling, um, mom should have known. Mom should have known and believed that they were behaving inappropriately. And there are friends of family that say, man, why would you ever give someone control when you knew that they were not behaving appropriately? And on a good day, the rest of the siblings can say, you know what? Mom did the same thing for me. When I was behaving badly, Mom chose to believe that we were not capable of behaving badly. Mom had the gift of grace. She had very strong morals and very strong values. And you know what? We all knew that, and every one of us failed to live up to them. And at various times, we were able to receive the gift of grace. And God help us. May we offer each other that same gift of grace. We're still working on it. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> But that is exactly what God offers us in Christ, the gift of grace. And each of us will have to give an account to God of how we welcome the other. Jesus is talking about the context of actual sin, and Paul is writing in the context of mere annoyances, and yet we still struggle as human beings but each of us will give an account to God of how we have welcomed and how we have forgiven the other, how we have been merciful and how we have shared the grace of God that has washed freely over us. Amen.